Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today to celebrate the 60th anniversary of Silent Spring. I'm Anna LaPay with the Pontereya Foundation and Real Food Media. And before getting started, I want to turn it over to our Spanish interpreters to explain how to listen in Spanish. Bienvenidos y gracias por unirse a nosotros para celebrar el 60 aniversario del libro Silent Spring, Primavera Silenciosa, de Rachel Carson, con algunas de las muchas personas que continúan llevando su legado. Soy Ana Lapé con la Fundación Pantarrea y Real Food Media, pero antes de comenzar, quiero pasarle la palabra a nuestras intérpretes para que les expliquen cómo pueden escuchar el webinario en español. Hola, soy Margo de WEPA Translations y es un placer para mí brindarles interpretación al español en la tarde de hoy, en la mañana de hoy. Eh, cuando Ken inicie la función de interpretación, van a ver un globo aparecer en la parte inferior de su pantalla. Si hacen clic en ese globo, van a poder seleccionar su idioma, español o inglés, y pueden poner en silencio el audio original. Si te están uniendo a nosotros de un dispositivo móvil, celular o tableta, no van a ver ese globo, pero una vez esté encendida la función de interpretación, van a los tres puntitos que dicen More o Más, y de ese menú desplegable pueden seleccionar Interpretación de idiomas o Language Interpretation. Una vez ahí, seleccionan inglés y español, pueden entonces poner en silencio el audio original y deben apretar el botón que dice finalizar o done para asegurarse que están en la sala correcta. Si se están uniendo a nosotros de una Chromebook, desgraciadamente la función de interpretación de Zoom no funciona. Les recomendamos que salgan del webinario y vuelvan a entrar de una computadora o dispositivo móvil. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Ken. You can start interpretation. Great. Thank you so much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are beaming in from. I'm Anna LaPay with the Pontereya Foundation and Real Food Media, and greetings to all of you. We're thrilled that more than 700 people registered and know that many more will be tuning into the recording. On behalf of myself and Kendra Klein from Friends of the Earth and all of our co-sponsors, we welcome you to Honoring Silent Spring. This event has been made possible in part thanks to the incredible generosity of our 38 co-sponsoring organizations, each doing incredible work, who helped us spread the word. In a moment, I'll ask each of our stellar panelists a question to kick off our discussion and then bring them into conversation together. For the last third of our time together, we invite your questions. So please, at any point during our webinar, look to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and ask us a question. And if you have any other concerns or questions, you can use the chat to reach one of our team members. So Silent Spring was first serialized in The New Yorker in the summer of 1962 and published as a book that September. As many of you know, when it was published, it rocketed to the top of the bestseller lists. Yes, a book about the toxicological properties of pesticides became a bestseller. It was scientific and poetic and world changing, alarming millions about the threats of pesticides, particularly the insecticide DDT. As many of you also know, President Kennedy was one of those people who was so inspired by the book that uh, he helped to spur on a congressional hearing that was held where Carson, Carson spoke passionately just months before her own death from cancer. We also know the book sparked incredible organizing but result in the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, a movement for organic food that would eventually lead to the creation of the National Organic Program at the USDA and so much more. She also faced enormous backlash from industry for trying, uh, that was trying to undermine her credibility and destroy her reputation, much of it targeting her as a woman. To give you just a taste, a former USDA secretary pondered in a public letter why, quote, a spinster was so worried about genetics. I've been thinking about Carson a lot lately not just because of this anniversary, but because of all that we keep seeing 
about how those who, are, who do this work still face the kinds of industry orchestrated attacks that she experienced and all we keep learning about how much more work there is to do. A 2020 Pesticide Action Network peer-reviewed study found over 385 million people experience acute unintentional pesticide poisonings every year. That's 44% of people involved with agriculture. In 2019, a meta study of insect declines found that one third of insect species are in serious decline around the globe. And if things don't improve, we could face near mass extinction within the next century. In other words, 60 years on, this conversation that Carson sparked is just as important as ever. At the time, Carson wrote, quote, a who's who of pesticides is therefore of concern to us all. If we are going to live so intimately with these chemicals, eating and drinking them, taking them into the very marrow of our bones, we had better know something about their nature and their power. I couldn't imagine a better group of people to talk with us about their nature and their power than those we have gathered here today. Kendra Klein, senior scientist at Friends of the Earth, Angel Garcia, co-director of Californians for Pesticide Reform, George Naylor, an organic farmer and member of the boards of Family Farm Defenders and the Center for Food Safety, and Carrie Gillum, veteran journalist and author of the Monsanto Papers and Whitewash. Unfortunately, Senator Cory Booker, who has been such a champion on these issues and who wanted to share with us a few words, was unable to join at the last minute. But I am guessing, had he been here, he would have lifted up his work around legislation he reintroduced in 2021 called the Protect America's Children from Toxic Pesticides Act. The legislation would ban dangerous pesticides, including organophosphates and neonicotinoids, and close loopholes that have allowed the EPA to issue emergency exemptions to use pesticides before they go through full safety review, and a whole lot more. So while he's not here, he's clearly doing critical work to carry on Rachel Carson's legacy, as are our panelists. So thank you again, the hundreds and hundreds of you tuning in uh, live as we engage in this conversation, the many more who will watch online. It's a real honor to be here. So I wanna bring in our first panelist into the conversation now. And I wanna start with Kendra Klein, Senior Scientist at Friends of the Earth. Kendra, you've been studying the literature and publishing research about the impacts of pesticides on human health and the environment. We hear from industry that pesticides are safe. We don't need to worry about it. And that they've only become more safe in the decades since Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring. But what have we really learned about pesticides harm since Rachel Carson published Silent Spring 60 years ago? I'd love for you to start us off there, Kendra. Thanks yeah. for being here. Thank you so much, Anna. And thank you so much to everybody, everyone attending. I feel like our over 700 RSVPs really speaks to the power of Carson's book and the way it has uh, changed so many of our lives. Um, so what have we learned since? While some key pesticides like DDT and the class that it belonged to have been banned in the years since the publication of Silent Spring, the use of toxic pesticides has only grown since then. In the US alone, we use over a billion pounds every year. And if I tested each one of us on this call today, I would find pesticides in our bodies. The pesticide industry would like you to think that that toxic trespass doesn't matter. But one thing that we've learned since Silent Spring was published is the fact that infinitesimally small exposures to certain synthetic chemicals, including over 50 pesticides, can mimic or block or scramble our hormones. And this endocrine disruption can lead to increased risk of a host of health problems from cancers and infertility to obesity, immune disorders, and more. 
So in recent decades, we understand a lot more about why small exposures matter. And yet this isn't taken into account when federal regulators set allowable limits of pesticides on our food. We also know we're exposed to a cocktail of different pesticides. Uh, for most of us, our primary exposure is through our diets. So take just a strawberry. We can find 10 or more different pesticides on a single strawberry. And yet that's not taken into account either when we set safe, quote, safe levels of pesticides on our food. So our regulations are woefully out of step with the latest science. And that's particularly concerning for the most vulnerable among us, and that is children and babies and infants in utero. Those early life exposures can have lifetime impacts. They can permanently decrease a child's IQ. They can lead to cancers later in life. So consider the fact that babies are now born pre-polluted with pesticides. A study from Environmental Working Group found 21 different pesticides in umbilical cord blood, and that's just out of 28 that they tested for. This is most concerning for kids who are born and grow up in farm country, who live and go to school and play near agricultural fields where pesticides are sprayed. They have higher risks of many health problems, including autism, learning disabilities, and cancers. And as you're going to hear more from on how farm workers and their communities are on the front lines of exposure and are suffering far greater health impacts as a result. So we are literally the bodies of evidence that demonstrate that this system needs to change. We are paying for the pesticide industry's profits with our health and our lives. As Carson told us six decades ago, our war against nature is a war against ourselves. And her use of the word war here is not hyperbolic because many common pesticides originated as weapons of war. So I gave a very brief snapshot of ourselves and health problems. So war against nature. Let's just take bees as an example. Globally, one in six bee species are regionally extinct and 40% are vulnerable to extinction. In the US, beekeepers are losing upwards of half of their colonies every year. And if Carson were alive today, she would be sounding the alarm bell about a class of pesticides called neonicotinoids or neonics. They can be a thousand times more toxic to bees and other insects than the infamous DDT. And they can persist in the environment for months or even years. And as we found in a study, um, that Friends of the Earth co-authored, co U.S. agriculture has become 48 times more toxic to insect life since the 1990s, and that is largely because of new nicotinoids. I like to say bees are like the canaries in the cornfield. Their deaths warn us that agriculture is on a toxic track for biodiversity. 40% of insect species face extinction. We've seen huge declines in songbirds, and animals from frogs to bats to deer are being impacted. And later I'm gonna to touch on how this is all intertwined with the climate crisis as well. So who wins? Not us, not the birds and bees, not the farmers who are stuck on a pesticide treadmill. In Carson's words, nature fights back. Weeds and pests develop resistance to commonly used pesticides. And then farmers have to use ever more and more toxic pesticides in response. So worldwide, since Silent Spring was published, hundreds of weeds and insect species have developed resistance to pesticides. In a poll of Iowa farmers, 90% of them reported feeling that pest management is a never ending technology treadmill. And despite this barrage of poisons, in Carson's words, farmers today experience just as much crop loss than they did decades ago. So who wins is the pesticide industry, which continues to have a ready and in many ways captured market. Take glyphosate, which many of us know as Roundup. Its ubiquitous use hand in hand with genetically engineered Roundup ready seeds has led to super weeds on millions of acres. And pesticide companies are now developing genetically engineered seeds that are tolerant to multiple toxic herbicides as a result antiquated herbicides that we know are highly problematic for our health, 2,4-D, Dicamba. And the use of, of herbicides, in fact, in the Midwest has doubled in the past 20 years. So we're seeing just as much pest pressure. We're seeing growing use of toxic pesticides um, and the crises of uh, our health being impacted, biodiversity loss, and as I'll touch on later, climate crisis are all intertwined. Pesticides 
elegantly and very destructively highlight this interwovenness of the web of life. And so I'll stop there and hand it back to you, Anna. Thanks, Kendra. I always learn so much from you and have just been so impressed with the research that you all have been doing, uh, very much continuing on the legacy of Rachel Carson. And I, I want to bring Angel Garcia into the conversation now. You mentioned Angel's work uh, with farm workers, farm worker communities in California. Angel's with the Californians for Pesticide Reform. And Angel, thank you so much for, for joining us and for all the work that you do. I remember the first time that we met uh, many years ago now, it was at a conference that was organized by the organization Beyond Pesticides. And you had organized an incredible panel of youth advocates uh, working with farm worker communities in California. And honestly, uh, from my perspective, sitting in that room that day, hearing you and your fellow organizers speak, I don't think there was a dry eye in the room as you talked about what uh, this battle looked like, what that war that that uh, Kendra was talking about looked like in your communities and on the ground. And uh, I wanted to bring you into the conversation to share uh, from your experience and your organizing, how this issue uh, plays out in the communities where you work uh, and would love to welcome you into the conversation. And again, thank you for being here on Hell. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for for the for having uh, me uh, be part of this conversation. I want to start off by saying that one of the major takeaways in my years of uh, working alongside farm workers has been the challenge to uh, break the isolation. Um, oftentimes, we um, come across families in different parts of the San Joaquin Valley in California that have a, a strong sense of experiencing pesticide drift um, in, um, alone. And what we've come to uh, realize uh, over the years is that it is through um, community organizing, through uh, collective power building that we've been able to really uh, bring visibility to the issue of pesticides. Which brings me to the other point, which is, Pesticides, uh, one of the major challenges of uh, addressing pesticides in the San Joaquin Valley is that they are invisible in the sense that they, you can't really see them. But at the same time, you, uh, one can really see that they're there, either through this pesticide application and it's happening or through the mist that one endures in the early mornings of the day or when one comes home from a long day of work. And so I think that uh, overall, the experience of, of farm workers when it comes to pesticides is uh, something that continues to happen to this day. As a, uh, the son of farm workers, and uh, my experience has been one that has been interwoven into this everyday reality that we need to do something. People are tired of being tired. And so what we've been doing here is we've been connecting with people, connecting with families, connecting with youth to really bring visibility to the issue of pesticides. Just imagine, for example, I still remember waking up at three, four in the morning every day because my parents would wake me up and tell me and remind me that I had a purpose and that purpose was to get an education. But yet they would go out into these fields and I would remember coming home and my parents coming covered in dust. Sometimes the dust would have a really strong chemical smell and I really wouldn't make sense of it at the time. But over the years, I have learned that my experience is not unique. It's an experience that's shared collectively among farm working uh, children and families across California and then across other regions as well. And so this idea that pesticides are not, are safe is, a, is something that it, we are continuing to address. And we're really informing farm working families that another world is possible but that world is possible once we start to collectively 
engage on the issue. Once we start questioning and really asking ourselves, what is it that we can do collectively to push or to get more information on how pesticides are impacting us? And so I remember that panel um, very well and glad to say that uh, a lot of them have gone on to continue that uh, pesticide reform movement uh, seed with them, carried it over. Some are community organizers. Others have ventured into other um, aspects of uh, social justice. But I think that at the end of the day, it is about building community power. It is about um, having to really want to uh, listen and be receptive to the farm worker uh, lived experience. One that is often in the shadows, one that has risen to the top during this pandemic, but that has only revealed um, a lot of the injustices that farm working families face on the everyday. And so I will, I plan to touch more on this, but um, I'll just keep my comments to that. And lastly, in Rachel Carson's words, uh, the obligation to endure gives us the right to know. And farm workers also have a right to know what they're being poisoned with every day. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much, Angel. Really wonderful to have you here again. That's Angel Garcia, co-director of Californians for Pesticide Reform. Want to remind everybody listening, you can put questions to our panelists into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Click on the Q&A, put your questions in there. Uh, and uh, this is definitely being recorded and will be made available to all of you by email, we post it online. And so there'll be ways to watch this again and share it with others. So uh, I wanna bring George Naylor into the conversation now. It's a real honor to have you here, George. And uh, as, a, as a farmer, uh, I uh, know you will have a lot to share with us uh, because the other messaging we hear from the industry alongside that, the message that their products are safe, we don't need to worry about it. The other message we hear is that farmers want these pesticides, that they need them, and that they're really just providing the product for farmers to enable farmers to be able to, to have a livelihood on the land. And that any attempt to regulate them is actually a direct harm to farmers. And I would love, George, for you to come into the conversation if you wanna share some of your own experience with pesticides and, and how you would respond to that messaging. Yes, well, thanks, Anna. It's a real privilege to be here. Um, my family moved to this farm in 1919 after farming and mining coal at least 20 years before that here in Greene County. Uh, I came back to the farm in 1976 with the intention of being an organic farmer, but uh, that wasn't in the cards back then. And then seeing the price of my conventional corn crop drop by 50% by the time of my second harvest drew me into farm organizations that stressed uh, land stewardship and creating a family farm system uh, based on the economic rules of parity. The, the dream of farming organically came true in 2014 with the help of my dear wife, Patty, who is on the board of the Pesticide Action Network. Uh, since 91% of the pesticides used today are in agriculture, I, just, I think it's essential to understand why this is true and understanding the logic of the market system guarantees this outcome. If we are to stop it, stop this chemical warfare, then we have to understand the economics of agriculture. Uh, and by the way, if we don't stop it, uh, it will continue and it will only get worse. And the f uh, farmers and the public will be propagandized into thinking that uh, the few farmers we have left will need to feed the world. Um, and I hope this history of my family farming and surviving through the Great Depression the farm depression in the 1920s and adapting and hunkering down can contribute to this discussion today. I think farmers in the most propagandized sectors of our society, you know, agribusiness touts the importance of sound science, but what they really mean is technology to serve their interest for more profits. And, and ecology is one science they avoid like the plague. They also avoid the sound, uh, sound economic science. Um, here's my copy of Silent Spring that my mother bought uh, for me uh, when I graduated from high school in 1966. Uh, oops, I'm giving away my age. 
Um, and that's meant uh, so much to me, along with uh, Earth Day and Anna's mother's book, Diet for a Small Planet. Um, and I tell people, if you have re haven't read this book, even though it was published in uh, 1961, you need to read it now. And if you haven't read it, if you have read it, you need to read it again. Uh, I just read it recently and I've learned more and more and it brought uh, many things into focus that uh, seem to have gotten uh, out of focus over the years. Um, she recognized some of the very important pitfalls and unintended consequences of the use of pesticides uh, like monocropping, which creates uh, an ideal environment for the pests that plague that crop. Uh, repeated spraying of the same pesticides recreate creates resistance and insecticides can harm beneficial insects that keep pests in check. Uh, she also talked about invasive species and I'm, I was surprised that there were even uh, systemic insecticides way back then that she was warning against. So some of the, th you know, there's no, some things uh, never change and there's uh, nothing new under the sun. Um, and one thing she stressed that was really important, I think, and Andrew Cambrell reminded me of this. Uh, she says we should be calling pesticides, all the pesticides, biocides, because they don't just uh, work on the pests that we're trying to target. They actually uh, mean uh, death and, and devastation for any other living thing. And uh, one of the things that she uh, was really concerned about, of course, was, uh, well, two things. One thing was uh, the loss of our ecosystem, the functioning of our ecosystems. And the other thing, of course, was the loss of our uh, genetic integrity, much like uh, the threat of uh, atomic radiation. And I'll use my uh, recent history on our organic farm to show how we have been, see, we've seen important changes, Patty and I, despite the loss of biodiversity all around us, thanks to crops being genetically engineered to resist glyphosate, that de deadly ingredient in Roundup herbicide. Uh, I, I can't document all of the loss of, of biodiversity around here, but I have no more uh, jackrabbits, no more redheaded woodpeckers. And uh, basically birds uh, that come through are usually on their way uh, migrating. But uh, this, uh, we do have a uh, kind of a, a refuge, so to speak, for various uh, species. Um, just this fall, many, round, uh, many monarch butterflies came to our windbreak and uh, we have wonderful pictures of them. Many, many hundreds actually. And they came in from our oat field where I have red clover growing. And I, when I combined, uh, when I harvested oats, I intentionally dodged the patches of milkweeds so they would have a place for uh, mating and, and having uh, young laying their eggs. Um, so um, I, I would say that, you know, we can have a refuge, but that's not the big picture. Uh, I uh, would like to show you a, a typical field of soybeans today uh, that is typical of corn and soybeans clear across the country to resist glyphosate glyphosate, along with uh, now it's either 2,4-D and dicama, dicamba. Uh, you see, because the weeds became resistant to Roundup, uh, they added these new, uh, this new engineering to make them resistant to 2,4-D and dicamba also. Um, and we, we Patty and I traveled all the way to Gloucester, Massachusetts this summer to attend a meeting of the National Family Farm Coalition, and all the way that's all we saw were corn and soybean fields that had absolutely no milkweeds, no flowering plants, and fortunately no plants except the corn and soybeans that were genetically modified to resist these herbicides. So you can imagine the loss of biodiversity. This is covering uh, over 250,000 square miles of, of corn and soybean land alone, not to mention uh, cotton fields and other uh, crops that are genetically modified. Um, the Center for Food Safety is launching a campaign this coming year to bring the full power of the Endangered Species Act to protect the monarch. So it's important that we keep this in mind. And 
Uh, also, I think it's important that we need to change the economic rules of agriculture. Um, and, and they've also challenged the inadequate uh, evaluations of uh, dicamba and 2,4-D uh, by the EPA. Um, and another thing that's important, we got to make connect some dots here. This corn and so these corn and soybeans are now raised only to feed livestock that are owned by corporations uh, in huge CAFOs and giant feedlots. So now the family farmer can't raise livestock and have good rotations on their farm anymore. That's all uh, corporate uh, control. Um, and they have no other choice except to raise uh, storable crops like corn and soybeans. Uh, it's been an ecological disaster. It's been a social disaster back here. Um, but there, and I can also report on some success from uh, Rachel's book, uh, Saving the Bald Eagles from DDT. Uh, it used to be I'd have to go to the Mississippi River to see bald eagles. And now I actually, once in a while, have a bald eagle land in my field, no more than 300 feet away from my tractor. Uh, getting a, a mouse or whatever kind of rodent that they find out there, much like the hawks do. Um, and then another thing that's important to know from agriculture is that now we're in an international market. The corn and soybean meal to feed those animals and capos can come from all over the world and they're priced as cheaply as they possibly can based on that international supply of corn and soybeans. So you will see on the nightly news at the same time that farmers are going broke here in the United States because of the low prices, you'll see the rainforest being burned in Brazil in order to produce more corn and soybeans. Now, how can that possibly make sense? And where are the leaders, are the leaders of this country and the leaders of the world uh, when that happens, thinking that the lungs of the earth are being destroyed to feed more animal and cave folks? Um, that I will leave it at that for right now, but I, uh, I have many more points to make about the, the, the insight that uh, Rachel Carson had regarding uh, agriculture and the use of pesticides. Well, thank you so much, George. I'll have my show and tell of my, my edition of Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, edited by Sandra Steingerber. And I, I, I love so much of what you had to share, in, including the story of, of seeing a bald eagle again on your land. And I'm reminded of visiting farms that have had that experience of uh, converting land that had been heavily uh, monocultured, using pesticides and converting it to organic and, and seeing nature come back, seeing the pocket ponds come back and frogs come back and the birds and the bees come back and that sense of the possibility of renewal uh, being there. So I wanna bring in our, our next and final panelist into the conversation and encourage you all to put your questions into the Q&A and also to, uh, to let you all know as we move into the broader discussion, I definitely am going to want to hear from all of our panelists about what can we do about all of this? Uh, what are some uh, strategic recommendations? Uh, what are some of the accomplishments we've already seen? But I want to bring Carrie in now. Uh, Carrie Gillum is a journalist who for uh, many years worked at Reuters and then at the nonprofit US Right to Know and now at the new lead. And Carrie, it's fabulous to have you in this conversation. And I've just learned so much from your reporting over the years and so appreciate your fearlessness and how you have uh, continued doggedly to track the industry. I have, I and many others have found you a very clear and convincing voice about uh, how pesticide companies operate. In the case of Monsanto, now owned by Bayer, how they misinform regulators about the safety of their banner herbicide Roundup. And just last week, you released a bombshell expose about a similar story of industry cover-up about Syngenta and the really toxic pesticide Paraquat. So bringing you into the conversation, Carrie, I would love for you to talk about uh, the tactics you're seeing companies use to try to shape the public debate and regulators' understanding of these products, what you've experienced yourself as a reporter on these issues. And again, welcome into the conversation, Carrie. It's really wonderful to have you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I appreciate being here and being part of this group. You know, Rachel Carson in Silent Spring, when I wrote my, my first book, um, I felt I was trying to channel Rachel Carson um, to a degree because I have so much regard for the work she did and the impact 
uh, that she had through her work. And, and I quote her in my first book, Whitewash, um, in many different places. So it's, it's particularly uh, a big honor for you to include me um, here. Yeah, I've been a journalist uh, for more than 30 years, more than uh, all of that, covering really corporate America, a whole array of different industries and little political and general news thrown in. Um, for more than 20 of those years, though, I have specialized or focused on the agrochemical industry. And uh, these are the companies that make and sell the pesticides that we're talking about today. And of course, if you listen to these companies, which I have, I've spent a lot of time, uh, you know, in the headquarters of Monsanto and, and uh, the people with DuPont and Dow and Syngenta, uh, BASF, all of these different uh, companies that are so powerful in this arena. If you listen to them, they will tell you that pesticides are, again, necessary to feed the world, that if they're used as directed, there's, there's really no harm that can come from them. And that, you know, 10 different types of pesticides on your strawberries uh, is nothing to be worried about. Uh, pesticide residue in your blood or your urine is nothing to be alarmed about. And webinars and, and people, you know, like wh who we've heard from this morning uh, are just trying to manipulate uh, the narrative and that you really should just trust the science and trust the companies and trust the regulators. You know, and that's a really powerful message. And when you back that with billions of dollars that these companies have, uh, you know, it, it does create sort of this narrative throughout the world. But what we've seen, what I've seen personally, and many other journalists and others who investigate, is when you dig below the surface and you get access to the internal communications of these companies, as we have, through freedom of information or through litigation or whistleblowers, it's a really different story and it's a really different narrative. And what you find out is that these companies really aren't as focused on safety as you think that maybe they should be. They're really focused on sales and protecting those sales when evidence of harm associated with their product begins to arise. Uh, they To do that, they employ a whole array of tactics. And I write about this in in uh, my first book, Whitewash, and you know, more than, I could spend a lot more than five minutes talking about it, but I'll try to hit some high points. Um, what we've seen, particularly in uh, with respect to Monsanto, uh, they adopted many of the tactics of the tobacco industry. They funded front groups, uh, different organizations that look to be authentic, independent, scientific uh, groups that write about science and write about chemicals and also write about people who write about these things um, and, we'll, and, we'll, and we'll put forward all this information about glyphosate doesn't cause cancer, glyphosate is necessary to feed the world, chlorpyrifos doesn't cause neurodevelopmental harm in children, uh, atrazine, you know, all of these different things, these authentic scientific looking organizations will promote and, um, and will even lobby regulators uh, but they will present themselves as though they are independent and they don't tell consumers or lawmakers or policymakers that they're actually getting money from companies like Monsanto. We have internal um, memos and emails where you can see uh, different groups, one group in particular, American Council on Science and Health, asking Monsanto for more money because they've done such a good job defending glyphosate. And you can see Monsanto writing back saying, you won't get a better uh, value for your dollar uh, than ACSH. Uh, you see them ghostwriting scientific studies. Uh, you see them paying PR groups to ghostwrite uh, editorials and letters to the editors that will appear in newspapers um, around the country, you know, where consumers are seeing this information. Uh, you see them ghostwriting um, articles to appear in magazines like Forbes magazine. Uh, all of these things have been laid bare uh, in these in these documents. And what I just reported on, um, as you pointed out, uh, Syngenta and Chevron, uh, makers of a chemical called Paraquat. Um, Chevron distributed this for many years. Syngenta is, is the main registrant and manufacturer. And this has been linked through much scientific research to the incurable brain disease, Parkinson's disease. And uh, what you see in these documents, as these companies get more and more aware of evidence that this chemical is crossing the blood-brain barrier, and is impacting these dopamine-producing neurons, 
uh, and, and killing them off in ways that cause Parkinson's disease. You don't see them alerting regulators to this. You see them instead trying to craft strategies as to how they can suppress that information or manipulate that information. And you know, we have documents as we as this was just reported last week in The Guardian and in, in my outlet, The New Lead, we co-published with The Guardian. These documents go back to 1958. Um, you know, and Paraquat is still on the market here in the US. Our US EPA just recently reaffirmed uh, the, the safety, the backing of Paraquat, finding that the evidence of its uh, ties to Parkinson's is insufficient. Um, some of the studies that they rely on, you see in their um, report on Paraquat, are studies that were done or paid for by Syngenta. Uh, you see that they discounted more than two dozen studies finding a positive association. Um, and, and this just happens over and over and over and over again. So I'm running over my time here. <laughs> I'm trying to keep it tight. But um, suffice to say, there's a multi-million dollar effort by these companies to manipulate media, to manipulate consumers, to manipulate and uh, collaborate sometimes with regulators and lawmakers. And it's a really, you know, it's a really hard um, thing to come up against that level of intentional deception. Um, so it does take people like this group and others uh, and everybody trying to be as informed as they can be and try to dig down and try to get to the truth. Um, you know, don't just listen to the advertisements and, and uh, these lies that you're being told by these front groups um, because there really is a lot more to the story. And thanks for having me here today. Thank you so much, Carrie. So I am going to invite all of our panelists onto our screen together now and to remind all of you, if you have questions, please put them into the Q&A. Uh, at the top of the hour, I will start bringing your questions into the conversation. Uh, just to remind you who we are here with today, we uh, have Kendra Klein, Senior Scientist at Friends of the Earth, Angel Garcia, Co-Director of Californians for Pesticide Reform, George Naylor, an organic farmer, and member of the boards of Family Farm Defenders and Center for for food safety, and Carrie Gillum, veteran journalist and author of the Monsanto Papers and Whitewash. And uh, so great to see all your faces together. <laughs> and uh, I have a bunch of questions. And as I was hearing you all talk, of course, even have more. Uh, but I want to uh, just keep my questions relatively short and opening it up to questions from people watching in at uh, the top of the hour. Uh, so if we can have everybody up on the screen, uh, I think, you know, where I would like to start, uh, you know, so much of what you all have shared is a chronicle of uh, the theme that is, that is, there is so much more work to do. And the theme that so much of what Carson warned us about 60 years ago is still alive today that we still need to confront. And so I thought I might start us off with a question about you know, where are you seeing examples of levers for change? Uh, I know on hell, your organization is really focused in California. Um, you know, where do you feel, maybe I'll start with you on hell with your organizing work. Have you seen uh, organizing that really has been critical in trying to make some of the change that we know we need? Yeah, I think that first, uh, the science has, has, has always been there. It's been on our side. And, and I think uh, Rachel Carson really elegantly um, placed it in, in her um, masterpiece, uh, Silent Spring. I think that um, part of the other question is like, well, where do we go or what can we do when a third of farm workers in the US are in California or when studies um, like the one that came out earlier this year, found that pesticides to be the greatest uh, pollution burden that showed, and that showed the greatest racial and ethnic disparity. Uh, or when we look at government's own data, our state government's own data, and we find that the uh, counties with majority Latin A populations are four times more likely to suffer from acute pesticide related illnesses. Uh, where do we go from here? I think for us at California for Pesticide Reform, it's been going back to the communities that uh, a lot of our organizers are a part of. And it goes back to in-person organizing because 
simply there's just no replacement to that. It goes back to going back to the living rooms, backyards, weekend meetings, meetings in the parking lots, the meetings after the meetings, meetings with decision makers. It goes back to strategizing. It goes back to what people already do. And so one of the great revelations during this pandemic has been that farm workers have a very organized and extensive network. That to me was such an epiphany. I suspected it, but it was confirmed. WhatsApp has worked wonders for a lot of our organizers here where we can schedule a meeting at a, just a, a message away. And so I think that for us, it's been uh, refocusing, re-emphasizing uh, community organizing, in-person community organizing, couple that with um, entry points at the state level, specifically the scoping plan, the 30 by 30, the SIP, where we are injecting pesticides into those conversations, while at the same time at the community level, uh, really um, making those connections as well, uplifting those uh, uh, lived experiences. Thanks, Alan Hill. And that kind of, that power of organizing, certainly your organization, Californians for Pesticide Reform, that's been such a central part of how you all work. Um, and any of the other of you want to jump in here? I, I have like my long list of questions and many pouring in, but uh, anything else you three would like to add? All right, let me, um, well, yeah, oh, go ahead, George. That Alan Hill hit the nail on the head as far as organizing. We have to be organizing. Um, you have to realize that looking at agricultural policy in this country, it's been a bipartisan project and it still is. There are no dissenters on either side of the party that uh, would change the agricultural policy to result in the le less use of, of pesticides. And uh, I mean, I guess I would like to uh, say that I'm a little bit alarmed of how global climate change is being used to uh, say that such and such is the result of global climate change when in fact the very attack on the on our ecosystem system is right before our very eyes and we're not doing anything about that and so um you know one thing about uh, rachel carson she she had incredible science but she didn't rely just on science to mo to motivate people she dedicates her book to albert schweitzer who said man has lost the capacity to foresee and to forestall. He will end by destroying the earth. I'm afraid that's hard to argue with, <laughs> but uh, it requires that we uh, really take all of this so much more seriously than we usually do. Yeah, well, George, I'm glad you brought climate and the climate crisis into the conversation because, you know, of course, when Rachel Carson was writing in 1962, uh, the crisis wasn't as clear to us as it is today. And of course, understanding that there is this direct linkage between agrochemicals generally, so pesticides and synthetic fertilizers and the fossil fuel industry and the climate crisis, that it's really important that in all of our conversations about pesticides, we're really connecting this to, to the climate. Uh, so I wonder if, if any of you wanna kind of pick up that thread, maybe Kendra, do you, do you wanna talk about the, the climate pesticides connection? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, so we can, we can think uh, multiple ways that this is connected. One is we hear a lot about soil lately. People are very excited about the possibility of healthy soil to sequester carbon and be a climate solution. Um, but all of that, which often is under the banner of regenerative agriculture, we need to be talking about pesticide reduction. And that is because pesticides pose grave harm to the very soil organisms, to the aliveness of the soil that allows it to draw down and store that carbon. And we found that in a recent meta-analysis from Friends of the Earth and Center for Biological Diversity and University of Maryland. It, it, across the board, pesticides cause harm to, to soil. And this is also uh, really important as farmers face increased droughts and floods because it's also the aliveness of the soil that allows it to be resilient, act like a sponge to draw down that water during a flood event or hold on to moisture during a drought. And so reducing our use of toxic pesticides is absolutely critical, both as a solution and as a, a mitigation measure. And then as you mentioned, these are petrochemicals, right? So this is um, 
the petrochemical industry, the production of pesticides is very energy intensive. And then also to bring back a point that George was making about uh, the, the use of so many acres of our farmland to grow corn and soy for animal feed. Um, the cutting down of rainforest to grow feed for animals. And we know that um, a very needed uh, solution in relation to the climate is to reduce um, the amount of animals that we eat. And so all of this is um, deeply bound together. Um, and I think that that's something that we really need to start educating people on is the connection between pesticides and climate change. Mm -hmm. So helpful, Kendra. So I uh, have one more question at the top of the hour. We're going to come to questions you've been putting into the Q&A. I see them pouring in uh, lots of brilliant questions, which doesn't surprise me when I look at the list of participants and know that many of you <laughs> are on the front lines of this fight as well. Uh, so I want to ask uh, one more question before uh, opening it up even further, uh, which, you know, one of the things I mentioned at the top of our conversation today was uh, the kind of backlash that Carson experienced from industry when Silent Spring was published and being struck that that kind of industry response to uh, scientists who are trying to help us all understand uh, what uh, how these pesticides affect us, how we're seeing that kind of backlash today. And I would love to hear uh, any of you share, and, and Carrie in particular, I know this is something that you've experienced, you know, share uh, what that personal experience has been like for you, but but also kind of starting to move us into the, the, the part of the conversation about, okay, and what, and what can we do about it? And, and how, do we, how do we face that? Uh, so Carrie, maybe uh, turning to you with this question, and then if any of you else wanna jump in, and then I'll start pulling together some thoughts on some of the questions that uh, are coalescing from the folks tuning in. Sure, backlash, yeah, I've experienced <laughs> for sure, right? <laughs> That's a, probably a very soft way to put it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think, I'll, so what, what has happened with me essentially is um, Monsanto uh, and, and the other companies all when I went to work for Reuters in late, late 1998 to cover the industry, they all very much wanted to woo me and have me in and teach me about their business and that sort of thing. And it was all very happy and friendly. And they do this with media. This is what they do. Um, uh, they try to woo them and bring them inside and uh, get to be friends with media. Um, as I learned more about the industry and studied the science more and spent more time with farmers and grain handlers and, and just a whole array of people, I began to learn that the corporate narrative was not necessarily the true narrative. And my story started to follow the science to a degree. And then what happened was it turned and the weight of the industry and particularly Monsanto turned against me. And I started seeing, um, you know, I started getting a lot of complaints to my editors at Reuters about, um, you know, false balance. I shouldn't be quoting people who had complaints about glyphosate uh, or genetically engineered crops. Um, it was it was a false balance to give critics any sort of voice in these stories. We should only be quoting the companies. Um, this is a tactic that they do. And they that that expanded until um, I started to see articles about me on the internet that were just, you know, a whole sorts of slander and false things that were put out about me that, um, you know, were very unflattering and, and uh, made me not look like a, a credible, authentic journalist. And some of these were coming from, as I mentioned earlier, these organizations that looked like they were pretty credible. One was called Academics Review. Um, another is American Council on Science and Health, another is called Le Genetic Literacy. And as you if go through the documents and you track back funding, you find that these companies are funded by uh, the agrochemical industry, particularly Monsanto. There's some really interesting documents um, that show Monsanto talking about wanting to set up academics review, for instance, um, but not wanting anybody to know that Monsanto was involved in it or, or part of it uh, and the money flow to these different academics that are doing that. So, you know, and they um, they go after any sort of outlet where I write, you know, Time Magazine had a piece there. They just, you know, besiege the editors. 
The Guardian. Uh, I write a lot of my articles with The Guardian, and uh, boy, those those poor editors there take a beating because <laughs> they just go after them. It's it's really to try to create so much noise and so much confusion and doubt that people just will turn away and just say, you know, I just I don't want to hear from that person. There's there's too much color there. There's too much noise and and doubt, and we don't really know if we can trust that that journalist or that scientist. They also do the very same thing. Um, to internationally known scientists, um, scientists with the International Agency for Research on Cancer uh, were attacked mercilessly uh, after they classified glyphosate as a probable human carcinogen in 2015. And I spoke with many of those scientists and they were so confused and just caught off guard because they routinely issue scientific findings on chemicals and other substances, uh, whether or not they find the science shows that they can be carcinogenic. They do that all the time. They've done it for years. And they never had the sort of backlash um, that they did uh, from when they classified glyphosate. So uh, it's real. It's out there. It's uh, There was a judge in, in federal court that remarked uh, in the Monsanto case, looking at the internal documents, uh, that the company had spent millions and millions and millions of dollars in sort of this disinformation campaign. And he made the comment, I'm um, paraphrasing, but, you know, if they had spent that money on doing safety studies, um, you know, as opposed to trying to uh, create a false narrative, they perhaps wouldn't be in the trouble that they were in. So um, that's just a taste of it, but it, it's pretty pervasive out there. Thanks, Carrie. So I want to start bringing in the, some of the questions that we're getting from folks uh, who are tuning in. And again, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A, but I can already issue a blanket apology <laughs> that I will not get to all of these questions in the next 25 minutes or so. I want to share with all of you tuning in or those that have to jump off now at the top of the hour, we will be sending a link to the recording. So if you're missing the next uh, bit of our conversation, you can listen in to the recording. We'll also be sharing uh, by email email to everybody who registered, links to many of the studies you heard our panelists refer to, all of their organizations to find out more about their work, as well as campaigns and other ideas from some of our three dozen co-sponsors who were part of helping us pull this event together. So I now have the unenviable job of, of <laughs> trying to, to select among these fabulous questions uh, for uh, the rest of our conversation together. Know that uh, the four of you prepare yourselves that we will come at the very end to kind of a rapid fire round uh, of a question that's come up a number of times. So I'm, I'm elevating it, which is simple in a way, but huge, which is what is one thing that people can do? What is, what is one way that people can engage? Uh, and so coming back to that, so put that into the, the back of your minds, but we will come back to it. Uh, but we'll start first with a, a, a specific question that came in, and then there are a few kind of like this uh, uh, on broadly on uh, policy solutions. And so one of the questions was uh, about how can the Farm Bill possibly be a tool to use to make progress in some of the things we're talking about? Uh, and then there was another kind of policy question more specifically about state level. Uh, and so on hell, uh, the organization where you're a co-director, Californians for Pesticide Reform, I know is really focused in California. Uh, but why don't why don't we start with this question uh, and, and which one of you wants to jump in on answering it first on uh, this kind of question on a, the, the policy lever, the possibility of the farm bill this time around being a tool we could uh, try to organize around uh, or on hell if you want to share uh, some of the work you're doing in California. I'm going to I'm going to jump in on this because I think it's really important that we make very clear that organic agriculture is an enormous solution if what we're concerned about is pesticide use. And some questions have come through about how do I avoid glyphosate or what food is glyphosate free? Is that labeled? It is labeled, it's called organic. Um, organic farmers by law are not allowed to use 900 different pesticides that are otherwise allowed in agriculture. And when we dismiss organic as elitist or pie in the sky, the pesticide industry wins and all the millions that Carrie is talking about um, also goes towards undermining our, our faith in organic agriculture. Um, because the more we shift 
our food system towards organic, the more we are um, undermining the market of the pesticide industry. So we know organic works. Dozens of studies, um, including one you can find at organicforall.org, uh, show that pes uh, organic diets dramatically reduce people's exposure to pesticides. We know that it reduces farmer and farm worker exposure um, and that it can help biodiversity thrive on organic farms. Like George is saying, the, the monarchs are stopping at his farm and not at the farms around him. Um, so I think that when we look at policy levers, flipping the system from subsidizing and supporting pesticide and intens intensive agriculture to supporting organic agriculture and other true solutions that are um, you know, reducing the use of these toxic pesticides is fundamentally important. And that's, uh, I'm not going to give you ways, exact ways <laughs> to do that other than that very big vision that I think we need to hold and work for and not be asking for pennies um, for the true solutions in the farm bill, but really um, working towards that, that fundamental change. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kendra. And we know policy change happens at, at these multiple levels at the city, county, at the state, and of course, federal, and, and really, of course, global as well. Uh, Angel, did you want to jump in to share your perspective from the work that your organization does in California about that kind of state level lever of policy change? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, when, when talking about pesticide uh, work in California, we have state preemption. So a lot of the, the effort, the energy also needs to focus at the state level. But um, to uh, Kendra's point, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree uh, that um, exploring alternative agricultural systems like uh, organic agriculture, but also agroecology um, can contribute. Uh, uh, not only do they contribute to uh, climate mitigation, um, adaptation and resilience, but they actually can measurably uh, reduce uh, chemical pesticide use and fertilizers. And so I think that injecting that type of language into, um, for example, the scoping plan, which is California's strategy uh, of how the state will uh, mitigate climate change is one concrete way of doing so. And I think that um, it's, it's it's important to, to be, um, engage or, or plugged into these type of conversations because this is, we're talking about a plan that will become, it's a long-term plan. And so I think that it's starting to have uh, these type of uh, uh, measurable um, pesticide reduction goals, at least to push that they uh, be uh, talked about as a starter and then hopefully have them be uh, included into um, for in this case, the, the scoping plan um, is one way of, of really addressing or really um, uh, leveraging uh, pressure at the state level. And, but again, that needs to also, I feel that that needs to also be coupled with on the ground, hyper-local community organizing um, at the same time, because these meetings need to hear what, uh, for example, Maria goes with her child that has autism, but yet she goes out to the meetings or what Mr. Um, Mr. Luis um, does when he comes straight from the fields to a uh, house meeting, still, still in his work clothes, and yet finds the energy to, uh, to, 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 to join the meeting and really um, talk about what um, local um, activities or actions we can do to really um, make pesticides much more visible. So I think that, um, yeah, I definitely think that engaging in, 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 in scoping plan um, can be one concrete way of doing that. Unfortunately, that, that ship sort of has been sort of sailed, but, but, but still, I think that um, it's really important to, to try to connect into these uh, state level uh, policies, because that's where a lot of this decision making happens. And yeah, so I just keep yeah. it up. Thanks, Angel. Yeah, I, I, this Go is ahead, George. Yeah, I'd like to say, you know, um, if we're depending on farmers to convert to organic, uh, that will not happen. Uh, very few people, farmers can afford to be, become organic. The risks are huge. 
And uh, I only was able to do that because I'm secure on my land that I own uh, and I've been farming for a long time, but uh, most farmers are not gonna make that choice. Uh, we as a nation have to make that choice. The policy has to change the rules, the economic rules of agriculture to do that. And um, for a little bit of history, the first farm bill was passed in the first year of Roosevelt's New Deal. And it eventually uh, achieved the goal of parity for farmers, which meant that the big corporations that bought our commodities had to pay a price that uh, was adjusted for inflation every year. And without that, which that policy was, was destroyed in 1953, without that, our commodities get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper every year. So that can support fewer farmers on the land. And, uh, you know, the, the weed guide, the Iowa State University weed guide of 2012 says that history has shown that a weed control program that depends solely on chemicals is bound to fail. Well, our agricultural policy guarantees that farms continue to get bigger and bigger. And the only way to control weeds is with chemicals. So the logic of that seems to me that our agricultural system will fail especially with the kind of values we have, uh, it's failing already. And it's failing farmers because farmers are going to be replaced by big data and um, artificial intelligence. Really big farms are not gonna be able to be managed by individual human beings, by farmers, let's say. It's, they're gonna be managed by artificial intelligence connected to the big chemical uh, companies and the big processors. Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, all of you. So uh, a theme to some of the questions coming in, uh, have uh, I'll, I'll raise up now uh, and, and see who wants to, to jump in to try to tackle them. But one was a question uh, about why aren't medical schools, including Rachel Carson's work in their curriculum? Uh, another question was around the American Cancer Society. Has that, as that institution kind of focused on these issues and taken this on? Uh, and then there was another question, which in this sea of questions, I'm not finding here, but it was generally and kind of geared toward you, Carrie, asking about uh, about this connection between universities and the, the corporate influence of universities research. And so I see all three of those questions about kind of uh, how to tap into the power of associations, networks, institutions uh, to try to uh, help educate people about these issues. So I don't know, Carrie, if you wanted to jump in on this question, uh, but also curious what others might have to say on these kind of three interlocking questions. Uh, yeah, I mean, what, what I could just say about that is yes. I mean, what you see is that a lot of our land grant universities um, you know, around the United States have their research pretty heavily funded by these companies. And what you hear from them is, you know, we need the money, right? We need the money to do the research. Um, and it, oftentimes you hear complaints because the chemical companies often then want to, you know, control the research, see it, shape it, um, control what is reported and what is not reported. Um, but, you know, this is a problem that's been mounting, I guess, for years and years and years. Uh, you know, I recall um, the, the story several years ago of a, a scientist, he actually worked for uh, USDA, but he was sort of embedded or positioned at the University of Missouri and, and did research there and taught and worked with students there and uh, was finding some very alarming things about glyphosate and what it did to the soil uh, and how it interacted in, in the soil. And, his work was suppressed and censored um, by the USDA, actually. Um, and he wasn't even really able to talk much about it uh, until he retired. But, you know, he his lab, he liked to remark, was in the shadow of Monsanto Auditorium. There was so much money flowing in there uh, to that university. So a lot of pressure from government, you know, from the political politicalization of our federal agencies, and then of course from uh, the corporate entities that are so closely in, entwined with our political leaders and, and policymakers. Thanks to any of the rest of you want to jump in, particularly what we're seeing, if anything, in terms of education in medical schools or uh, groups like the American Cancer Society. I don't know if any of the three of you want to add anything. 
I would just say, yes, that's a huge um, hole in the education of health professionals. Um, and there are organizations like Healthcare Without Harm and Physicians for Social Responsibility, they're working on shifting that. Um, but, you know, we have a very reductionist approach to health and also a health system that tends to blame individuals for their health problems. And so shifting towards a holistic and an ecological perspective where we understand the, the social, the environmental drivers of health is a, is a much bigger transformation that needs to happen. Um, and we would take into account not only pesticides, but many, many different industrial chemicals that are um, driving increasing rates of all sorts of diseases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember a number of years ago, the uh, under Obama, there was a, a a federal panel on cancer, and and it was kind of this this kind of seminal study that came out, uh, signed by many uh, healthcare and doctor professionals, and one of their clear findings and clear points of advocacy was one of the best things you can do for for children to help uh, prevent potential cancers is to expose children to as few foods that have been grown with pesticides. I can't remember if the report actually used the word organic or just said, you know, avoid avoid pesticides. Uh, but essentially, that's one way to do so, right? Um, so, you know, we've had those moments, but I think we aren't hearing it as loudly and clearly from these institutions as I think I think we should be. Um, so another question that's come in uh, uh, that I, I think would be interesting uh, for us to talk a little bit about, uh, someone wrote in, I was appalled to see a map of pollution burdens of pesticides in California, an environmental justice meeting in Salinas. It showed about 90% of the city in purple or deep purple, in other words, highly exposed. Um, how can we easily access this information to inform others? What solutions do you suggest for cities like Salinas, salad bowl, capital of the world, uh, that has built so many schools and homes uh, so close to uh, so many toxins. And, and Angel, I thought we could turn to you for this one. Yeah, we, we have a, a community organizer that works with communities in that region. And I think that one of the best uh, or, or most immediate ways is to uh, connect to, to our community organizer there and to the local coalition by the name of Safe Facts, Safe Schools, or SAS for short. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, a lot of this information, um, I mean, it, it's, it's like this public education is ongoing. Uh, it never stops. Uh, no matter how many health fairs or community events our organizers or our coalition members go to, there's always people that this is the first time that they're hearing it. So I think it just speaks to the, to, again, to that point that pesticides, um, uh, it's sort of an invisible thing. And, and, and unless it's sort of like really just continuously just put out there um, and, and this ongoing public education is, is, is not, is, is, is happening then, or is not happening, um, then it's, it's gonna remain the way it, it would. But I, I, would, I would say that um, visiting the website pesticidereform.org um, would be another immediate way. And then from there connecting because pesticide, uh, California's pesticide reform is also a network of over 180 organizations, and uh, I'm sure we can definitely and certainly connect to the uh, most appropriate or, or more um, local organization in their respective uh, community. But yeah, I think uh, for in this particular case, I think connecting with the local organizer, again, going to our website and, and, and checking that out would be uh, one immediate um, step that they can do. Thanks, Angel. So I want to come to another question, and, and George, maybe this is one you could jump in on. Uh, we had a question about, uh, someone was asking us to address the contradiction, contradictions of cover cropping as a quote unquote climate smart agriculture practice and the use of herbicides to burn down cover crops before planting cash crops. <laughs> so for those listening who might not be a farmer, that might need to be unpacked a little bit, but uh, it, it gets back to this linkage between climate and agriculture and pesticides and what are some of the real solutions we should be fighting for and what are some of the solutions that are being dressed up as, as climate smart but might not be. And George, if you wanted to jump in. Well, it's, uh, it's hard to argue that cover crops aren't a good idea and uh, organic farmers use cover crops all the time. But uh, if you'll notice uh, cover crops and climate smart agriculture and regenerative agriculture are the go-to answers of agribusiness 
to really placate the concerns of most uh, people in this country about what's happening to agriculture, what's happening to the soil. Um, uh, the real question is, is what kind of an agriculture will be really climate smart, will be um, sequestering carbon in the soil and holding the soil in place and encouraging biodiversity. A, uh, a, a simple cover crop of rye that's gonna be terminated with, with uh, Roundup in the spring uh, is not really encouraging biodiversity. And um, so uh, let me see, I wanted to say something here. Um, uh, well, you want you to skip me for a minute, I'll come back. Oh, I, uh, for instance, a big, a big uh, idea is that uh, no-till is an answer to this problem. Well, like you say, lots of times, well, and it, and it, re, it was really no-till that brought about the uh, resistance of weeds to Roundup because in no-till, you use Roundup as a burn down before you plant the crop. You use Roundup to kill the little weeds that uh, come up after the crop's planted. And you use Roundup later on to get the weeds that missed the first two times. So uh, that's three times in a row plus you're raising corn and soybeans every year. So that's a, a sure way to use Roundup, uh, overuse Roundup and make it obsolete uh, and destroy biodiversity completely across the land. Uh, so no-till is not the answer. Um, anyway, so uh, yeah, um, the, the real answer when you talk say, okay, should we have no-till or should we have something else? The something else is to have livestock on the land. Uh, to have hay and pasture so that the, uh, those two ways of growing things uh, sequester carbon in the soil with very deep roots. And they provide nitrogen for the next corn crop. And they also make weed control so much easier. But the trouble is though that solution is, is not tenable because cheap corn and soybeans end up feeding livestock in CAFOs and great big feedlots. That means farmers don't have the opportunity to have livestock on the farms anymore. And so that has to change because we change the rules of, of the economics of agriculture and make sure that farmers, we would have to overall overhaul our agricultural system and that would have to include parity prices for farmers. Mm -hmm. Thanks, George. I wanna bring in another question that touches on a, an aspect of this conversation we haven't really yet talked about. And, and Carrie, I thought maybe you could jump in here possibly, which is a question that was asked, how do we fight a legal system that is built to protect the pesticide industry? The system is working for them. What can we do to provoke a change in that partnership between government and big industry and, and kind of using the legal system in that way? And, and Carrie, I thought you might have some insights here, particularly in the reporting that you've been doing of the uh, legal strategies uh, that have, are being deployed uh, to try to protect people from toxic pesticides. <laughs> I don't think I have the answer. Um, I, I really don't. I know, I mean, what's happening right now, particularly with EPA, is I think very uh, much to be applauded. You know, we have five whistleblowers, five EPA scientists who have come forward uh, just over the last year and really risked their careers, their reputations. Uh, and I've talked to some of them and they're going through just incredible stress and strain, but come forward with emails and text messages to reveal how they try to do their jobs. These are EPA scientists and the top brass, the management at EPA being influenced by um, corporate, you know, um, corporate influences, how they are tampering with uh, assessments of these chemicals and hiding human health harms and that sort of thing. And they brought forward some really just uh, outlandish and, and damning information about this. And uh, we're told that the Office of Inspector General is looking into this, and I think if people care about this and they care about the integrity of our regulatory system and they want our government to work for the taxpayers, the people, you know, who, <laughs> who our government is supposed to protect and serve, uh, you know, you just, you need to be aware of this and you need to be telling your representatives what you think about this sort of thing. Um, so often I think we get blinded to corruption and misdeeds out of Washington. And we just sort of say, ah, oh, this is the way it, it, it goes. Um, and, and that's the way it's gonna keep going, I think, unless, unless we do become more informed and more engaged uh, about this sort of thing. But, you know, these are really brave people. Um, 
putting their careers on the line to come forward to try to, you know, be just all they want to do is do their jobs, right? And and be um, in the EPA and try to do the jobs that they're supposed to do. And um, we've seen different administrations try to address this, try to address the issues of scientific integrity, is how they refer to it. Uh, and it hasn't really ever been very successful. Um, Biden has also recently at least given lip service to this. So, you know, there's there's an open ear, I think there's a way to have a conversation, but um, it just, it requires engagement, certainly. Yeah. Thanks, Carrie. So we're we're coming to the end of our time together, and I feel like it flew by. And many questions that came in were fabulous. We will be sending out a resource email that will include a link to this recording and some answers to some of the questions that we didn't have a chance to get to. So we have just a few minutes. So we have this rapid fire round <laughs> uh, of probably the biggest question of all, which is, what can we do about this? Uh, but one of the questions uh, that came through was, what is the most impactful thing that we can each do? And there's, of course, many answers to that question. And so I'd like to take a moment, we'll come around to each of you and starting with you, Kendra, uh, uh, and then to you, George, and then Carrie and Angel. What is that one thing that you would recommend uh, that those of us are listening, who care, who want to continue on with this legacy of Rachel Carson, what can we do? Kendra? Yeah, I think um, taking action as a citizen and as a consumer. And as a citizen, I would say vote for candidates who don't take corporate money, who are not in the pocket of big ag and are going to be willing to go up against them and, and make the changes that we need politically. And as a consumer, um, buy organic when you can. It's a real solution that's backed by federal law and um, not only protects your body and your families, but um, everybody along the supply chain. Thanks, Kendra. Uh, so uh, George Naylor, to you next, rapid fire. What's one thing? Say people need to get the big picture and they need to share that big picture with their neighbors and their family. Um, I've gained a whole new appreciation of what the land is in terms of it's not just soil, it's not just some place where you uh, grow stuff on and you uh, put up for sale so some in uh, investor can buy it. Uh, when you think of the uh, uh, African American farmers of the South, how much they uh, valued their land and how that was uh, essential to their society there. And then indigenous people, they talk about, well, hey, that mountain or that uh, whatever uh, is sacred. Uh, we all need to start recognizing that uh, our earth is sacred and everything about it. And I'd just like to quote uh, Rachel Carson a minute. She says, the question is, is whether any civilization can wage relentless war on life without destroying itself and without losing the right to be called civilized. I think that's the big picture that we need to start. We need a, a spiritual revolution. Just that. Thanks, George. Carrie. I, I think we're all kind of saying the same thing, awareness and engagement, uh, really. And what is important to you is what you should be communicating to, you know, elected leaders. And, and uh, we hear all the time about foreign policy and economic policy, and we don't hear as much or talk as much about food policy. There's nothing more foundational to our health, right, and our the health of our children and future generations than the food that we eat every day. Um, so this is something that we should be elevating, uh, to a conversation, you know, on, on many different levels, I think. Thanks, Gary. Angel? Yeah, for those in California, the week of November 7th is going to be major. Uh, Department of Pesticide Regulation, who's a former uh, director, by the way, uh, now works for Syngenta, um, but that's a different, whole different story. Um, <laughs> At the moment, uh, the Department of Pesticide Regulation is developing a first in the world, a first of its kind pesticide notification system. They're going to be having in-person workshops in two communities in the whole state. And uh, one of them is going to be no Monday, November 7th, and that's going to be in Oxnard, California. The other one is going to be on Wednesday, November 9th, and that's going to be in Orosi, uh, California. And uh, the last one, and this one will probably be much more uh, uh, feasible, and that's uh, Nova, uh, Thursday, uh, November 10th. Um, that one's going to be via, uh, via Zoom, but 
these are going to be in person uh, or there's going to be uh, hearings on what the people need uh, or would like to see in the pesticide notification system. And so I think that those are some very concrete, immediate things that y'all can do. If you are in California, make that drive, connect with the farm workers. Let's join because together is how we can make this happen. Now, for the broader audience, um, I would invite them to, again, uh, connect with the local, uh, any local organization there, go to a meeting and start from there. Great. I love it. And we will be sending out links so you can find out more so you can join us in person or in Zoom at those events. Uh, so if we were in a big auditorium together, it would be huge because there are hundreds of you. <laughs> and right now would be the moment where we would all be uh, applauding all of you. You can keep them all up on the screen. We would be applauding all of you, thanking you for your incredible work. Again, we were joined today with Kendra Klein, Senior Scientist at Friends of the Earth, Angel Garcia, co-director of Californians for Pesticide Reform, George Naylor, organic farmer and member of the boards of Family Farm Defenders and Center for Food Safety, and Carrie Gillum, veteran journalist and author of the Monsanto Papers and Whitewash. Again, I hope you can hear the applause. <laughs> uh, I, I certainly know uh, so many people so appreciate the work that you do. It's been an honor to be here with you. Uh, as we close our time together with these incredible people, want to thank the New School at Commonweal for bottom lining tech support, for Tiffany Patton uh, from Real Food Media for her help in the chat and Q&A and live tweeting, to everyone at Friends of the Earth for their support, to all of our co-sponsors, and for those who've registered, again, you'll receive an email with this recording. And for those watching online, please click the resources below. So in final closing, of course, we have to end with the words of Rachel Carson, who wrote, we still talk in terms of conquests. We still haven't become mature enough to think of ourselves as only a tiny part of a vast and incredible universe. Man's attitude toward nature is today critically important simply because we have now acquired a fateful power to alter and destroy nature. But man is a part of nature and his war against nature is inevitably a war against himself. So thank you again, all four of you wonderful humans who we can see on the screen and for all of you tuning in, all the incredible work you do. It's been an honor to be here. Uh, I know that all of you are, live into the legacy of Rachel Carson and the work you do and are working to help us all reimagine our relationship with nature for the benefit of all. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you uh, to the four of you. It's been a real pleasure. And thank you to our co-sponsors. Again, I'm Anna LaPay with Real Food Media and the Ponte Rea Foundation and behalf on, Kendra Klein, uh, on behalf of Kendra Klein from Friends of the Earth and all of our co-sponsors, thank you and have a wonderful day.